In the village of Nkiru, a young woman named Amora embarks on an extraordinary journey under the guidance of Ikin, a master tracker. But as they prepare to challenge the tyranny of the Kizoba family, a shocking discovery turns their world upside down, Ikin's father, thought to be lost forever, reappears after mysteriously vanishing for 30 years. Secrets long buried are about to surface, but what dangers lie ahead? Join us as we unravel the mysteries and face the challenges that await in this epic tale of resilience and hope. Prepare yourself for a story that will keep you on the edge of your seat. The adventure begins now. In the heart of Africa, nestled between vast savannas and dense forests, lay the village of Nkeru. This village thrived amidst the lush landscape, surrounded by the rich flora and fauna of the African wilderness. The air was filled with the sounds of chirping birds and the distant roar of a lion, reminders of the wild and untamed world beyond the village boundaries. The village is always buzzed with different activities every blessed day. Women will sit in groups, weaving colorful baskets from reeds, their hands moving skillfully as they chatted and laughed. The vibrant patterns of their baskets reflected the rich cultural tapestry of Nkeru. Their fingers danced over the materials, creating intricate designs that told stories of their heritage and history. You could also hear the noise of children running through the village, playing traditional games. Their laughter echoed through the village, adding to the joyous atmosphere. The children's energy and enthusiasm were infectious, reminding the elders of their own youth and the timeless traditions that connected generations Elders gathered every evening under the ancient baobab tree, a symbol of wisdom and longevity. They sat on intricately woven mats, sharing stories of old. Their voices were filled with emotion as they recounted tales of past hunts, legendary warriors, and the spirits of the forest. Among the village elders was Adisa, a venerable storyteller whose tales of the past kept the village's history alive. His hair was white as the snow-capped peaks in the distance, and his eyes sparkled with the wisdom of ages. He sits every night under the moon with the villagers, young and old alike as they all listen intently, their imaginations fueled by his vivid storytelling. The baobab tree stood as a silent witness to the passage of time and the enduring legacy of Nkiru's culture. Dot at the center of it all was King Obesai, the wise and just ruler of Nkiru. Tall and regal, with a commanding presence, King Obesai will walk through the village once every month to see the life of the villagers. He's clothed in traditional robes adorned with symbols of his lineage and a crown made of gold and feathers, signifying his status and wisdom. King Obesai was not just a ruler, he was the guardian of Nkeru's traditions. Nkeru was known for its rich traditions and deep seated cultural practices. Every 30 years, the village held a prestigious ceremony known as the Umitivo Hunt. This grand event was not merely a hunt, it was a celebration of bravery, skill, and the enduring spirit of the people of Nkiru. The Umitivo Hunt determined the village's second in command, titled Okabashi, a word that symbolizes strength, wisdom, and leadership. The title was highly coveted as the Okabashi was seen as the embodiment of these virtues and was revered almost as much as the king himself. For generations, the Kizoba family had held the title of Okabashi. Their lineage boasted exceptional hunters, each one more skilled than the last. Their influence grew so vast that even King Obesai feared them. The Kizobas were exempt from taxes and enjoyed numerous privileges, such as priority access to the village's resources, lands, and the right to the first harvest, after the king. The Kizoba compound was a sprawling estate, surrounded by high walls and guarded by loyal servants. The courtyard was filled with lush greenery and exotic flowers, a testament to the family's wealth. In the center, a grand ancestral shrine stood, 
where offerings were made to honor their forebears, legendary hunters whose spirits were believed to guide the family. Odian, the current heir, was lounging amidst his friends stunned, Kamal, and Amodi, under a shaded pavilion in the compound. They were drinking wine from intricately carved gods, laughing loudly, and surrounded by a group of beautiful young women. The air was filled with the sound of their merriment and the soft melodies of traditional instruments played by a few hired musicians. Odian reclined comfortably on a plush mat, his arm draped around a young woman who looked at him adoringly. Life is good, my friends, he said with a lazy smile, taking a deep sip of his wine. Once I win the title of Okabashi, it will only get better. Kamal chuckled, refilling his god. And with all these lovely ladies vying for your attention, who could complain? Tund, who was busy flirting with another woman, nodded in agreement. Every parent in the village wants their daughter to marry you, Odian. They know you provide a life of luxury. Amadi added with a smirk, but we get to choose and replace them like rags, promising them the world. And they believe us, every time. Odian's eyes gleamed with a mix of arrogance and entitlement. Of course they do. Who wouldn't want to be the wife of the Okaboshi? These women are just waiting for their chance. As they continued their reverie, a stern voice cut through the laughter. Odian. Iskizoba, Odian's father and the current Okaboshi of Nkiru village, stood at the entrance of the pavilion, his face a mask of displeasure. The musicians fell silent, and the young women quickly stood up, bowing respectfully before hurrying away. Odian sat up, a look of irritation crossing his face. Father, we were just having some fun, Odian said, trying to mask his annoyance. Iskizoba's gaze was unwavering. The Yumutivo hunt is only a month away, and here you are, wasting time. You should be on the lookout, recruiting and eliminating every threat that comes your way, not indulging in idle pleasures. Odian sighed but stood up, knowing better than to argue. I know, father. We've already won so many times. This one will be no different. Iskizoba stepped closer, his voice low and intense. Do not underestimate the importance of this hunt. Our family's power and privileges depend on it. We are not always the best hunters, but we buy the best hunters to submit to you as if they resist, we make sure we finish them. Do not forget this secret. You must be ready to do whatever it takes to ensure our victory. Use every resource, every bit of knowledge at your disposal. You must be relentless. Odia nodded pretending to understand the gravity of his father's words. As his kizoba departed, Odian burst into laughter, turning back to his friends. More wine, my friends. We'll train tomorrow. Tonight, we celebrate. The group resumed their merrymaking, unaware of the challenges that lay ahead and the consequences of their arrogance the bustling village market of Nkiru was alive with vibrant colors and the sounds of everyday life. Women haggled over the prices of fresh produce, children played nearby, and the aroma of freshly baked bread filled the air. Amidst this lively scene, Amara moved gracefully, her presence commanding respect and admiration. Known for her intelligence and kindness, Amora was a woman who valued integrity over power and wealth. As Amora carefully selected yams from a vendor, she felt a sudden hush fall over the market. Turning, she saw Odian Kizoba striding towards her with a confident smirk. His friends, Tant, Kamal, and Amodi, flanked him, their expressions arrogant and intimidating. Odian, the heir to the Kizoba family's legacy, was used to getting what he wanted. Good day, Amora, Odian greeted her, his voice dripping with self-assured charm. Good day, Odian, Amora replied politely, her demeanor calm and composed, 
Odian extended a beautifully crafted necklace made of gold and precious stones, its brilliance catching the sunlight. For you, Amora, he said, a token of my admiration. And there is more where that came from. A life of luxury awaits you, if you choose to be with me. Amora looked at the necklace, then at Odian. Her eyes, deep and unwavering, reflected her resolve. Thank you, Odian, she said, her voice steady. But I must decline your offer. A murmur of surprise rippled through the market. No one had ever dared to reject Odian, the powerful heir of the Kizoba family. Why? Odian demanded, his pride wounded. Do you not see the life I can offer you? Wealth, comfort, everything you could ever desire. Amora stood tall, her ebony skin glowing in the midday sun. I value my independence and dignity more than material wealth, Odian. I wish to live a life of my own choosing, not one dictated by power and privilege. Odian's face darkened, anger flickering in his eyes. He was not used to being denied. You will regret this, Amora, he warned, his voice low and menacing. No one says no to Odian Kizoba. Amora held his gaze, unflinching. I am not afraid of you, Odian. I will not compromise my values for anyone. With a final, disdainful look, Odian turned and stalked away, his friends following closely behind. The market slowly returned to its usual hustle and bustle, but the air was thick with tension. Amora resumed her shopping, her heart beating steadily. She knew she had made a powerful enemy, but she stood firm in her decision, embodying the strength and courage that would soon become pivotal in the unfolding events. The sun hung low in the sky, casting a golden hue over the serene landscape as Amora made her way to the river. The gentle flow of water and the rustling of leaves in the breeze provided a tranquil soundtrack to her thoughts. She filled her clay pot, savoring the peaceful solitude of the moment, away from the bustling village and its complexities as she turned to head back, balancing the pot on her head with practiced ease, Amora noticed a rustling in the bushes. Her heart skipped a bit when she saw Odian and his friends, turned, Kamal, and Amodik, emerge, their expressions dark and determined. Going somewhere, Amara. Odian sneered, blocking her path, her pulse quickened, and she glanced around, seeking an escape route. I just want to return home, she said, trying to keep her voice calm. Odian stepped closer, his friends spreading out to surround her. You embarrassed me in front of everyone at the market, he said, his tone menacing. Do you think you can get away with that? Amora's grip on the pot tightened as fear gripped her. Please, Odian, just let me pass. Odian's face twisted with anger. Not until you agree to be mine, he demanded. No one rejects Odian Kizoba. Amora's heart raced. She tried to step back, but Tan and Kama blocked her retreat. The river, her once tranquil refuge, now seemed like a trap. What's it going to be, Amora? Odian's voice was a low growl. Will you accept your fate, or do we have to convince you? Just as all hope seemed lost, a strange, haunting sound echoed from the surrounding bushes. It was a chilling wail, unlike anything Amora had ever heard. The legend of the evil spirit, said to haunt the forest and kill anyone who crossed its path, filled her mind, Odian and his friends froze, their bravado fading as the eerie voices grew louder and more insistent. What is that? Kamal whispered, his eyes wide with fear. I don't know, Odian muttered, taking a step back. Let's get out of here. In their panic, they fled, leaving Amara trembling and alone on the ground. The strange voices continued for a moment, then fell silent, replaced by the soft rustling of leaves, from the bushes, a figure emerged, laughing heartily. 
Amola looked up, her fear turning to confusion. The young man who approached her had a kind face and a reassuring presence. Are you all right? he asked, extending a hand to help her up. Amora hesitated, then took his hand. Yes, thank you, she said, her voice shaky. Who are you? My name is Ikin, he said, smiling warmly. Don't worry about those cowards. They won't bother you for now. Amora looked at him, curiosity mixing with gratitude. How did you do that? Ikin chuckled. Let's just say I've learned a few tricks from living in these parts. It's amazing what you can do with a little creativity and a lot of practice. He gently guided her back to the village, carrying her water pot for her. As they walked, Amora felt a sense of safety she hadn't known before. In Ikin, she sensed not just a protector but a friend, someone who would stand by her in times of trouble, their journey back was filled with conversation, Ikin's light-heartedness easing Amora's tension. By the time they reached her home, a bond had begun to form, one that would prove crucial in the challenging days ahead. Nestled at the edge of the village, Ikin's home was a modest hut surrounded by a small garden and patches of wildflowers. The air was filled with the sweet scent of blooming flowers, and the soft rustling of leaves provided a soothing backdrop. Inside, the hut was simple yet cozy, adorned with handmade crafts and tools that spoke of a life lived in harmony with nature. Ikin, a young man of quiet strength and wisdom, was the son of Udo, a legendary hunter whose name was still spoken of with reverence. Udo had mysteriously disappeared before the last Yumutivo hunt, leaving behind a legacy that weighed heavily on Ikin. Despite inheriting his father's formidable skills, Ikin chose a life of peace, away from the village's politics and rivalries that often brought conflict and discord. One warm afternoon, Amora visited Ikin's home. She was greeted by Ikin, whose warm smile and calm demeanor always put her at ease. They sat outside on a woven mat, the sunlight filtering through the trees casting dappled shadows around them. Tell me more about your father, Amora asked, her eyes filled with curiosity that Ikin's gaze softened as he spoke of Udo. My father was a great hunter, respected by all. He taught me everything I know about the forest, about tracking and survival. But he was more than just a hunter, he was a man of honor and kindness. His disappearance before the last Yumotivo hunt remains a mystery that haunts me. Amora listened intently, sensing the deep connection Ikin had with his father. She admired his strength and the quiet resilience he carried within him. Would you teach me some of the skills your father taught you? Amora asked, her tone eager yet respectful. Ikin nodded, his eyes lighting up with a mix of nostalgia and pride. Of course. Let's start with something simple. He led Amora to a nearby clearing where he began to teach her the basics of tracking animals. He showed her how to recognize different tracks, how to read the signs left by various creatures, and how to move silently through the forest without disturbing the wildlife. Tracking is about observation, Ikin explained. You must learn to see what others overlook. Every broken twig, every displaced leaf, tells a story. Amora practiced diligently, her determination evident in her focused expression. Under Ikin's patient guidance, she began to understand the subtleties of tracking. Next, Ikin taught Amora how to navigate the forest using natural markers like the position of the sun, the flow of streams, and the patterns of the stars at night. He explained the importance of knowing one's surroundings and being aware of the natural rhythms of the environment. Nature has its own language, Ikin said. If you learn to listen and observe, it will guide you. Their lessons extended into the evenings, where they would sit by a small fire, sharing stories and laughter. Ikin told tales of his father's adventures, of the wisdom he imparted, and the values he instilled. 
Amora shared her own dreams and aspirations, finding in Ikin a kindred spirit who understood her desire for independence and self-worth as days turned into weeks, their bond grew stronger. Amora's skills improved, and she felt a newfound sense of confidence and capability. Ikin, too, found solace in their friendship, a reminder of the goodness and strength his father had embodied in that moment, surrounded by the serene beauty of nature and the glow of their shared understanding, Ikin and Amora knew that their friendship was destined to play a crucial role in the challenges that lay ahead. The village square of Nkiru was abuzz with energy and anticipation. The Yumutivo hunt was approaching, and the air was filled with a mix of excitement and tension. Young men from all corners of the village were gathered, training rigorously under the watchful eyes of their elders. The sound of wooden spears clashing, arrows hitting targets, and feet pounding against the ground created a symphony of preparation, families cheered on their sons, offering words of encouragement and advice. The elders shared stories of past hunts, their voices rich with pride and nostalgia. This hunt was more than a competition, it was a rite of passage, a chance for these young men to prove their bravery, skill, and what, among the crowd, the Kizoba family stood out with their aura of confidence and superiority. Odian Kizoba and his friends, Tand, Kamau, and Amodi, trained apart from the others, their equipment superior and their techniques honed to perfection. The Kizoba family's wealth and influence were evident in every aspect of their preparation. Behind the scenes, the Kizoba secret strategy was at play. From a young age, their children were trained by the best hunters money could buy. They were taught advanced techniques, strategies, and survival skills that were beyond the reach of most villagers. Additionally, they recruited the most skilled young hunters in the village, forming an elite group that ensured their dominance in the hunt. This unfair advantage had kept the title of Okaboshi within the Kizuba family for generations. Their influence extended to the point where even the king hesitated to challenge them openly. As the preparations continued, whispers of the Kizuba's secretive methods circulated among the villagers, fueling both resentment and awe. The bustling market of Nkero was alive with vibrant colors and the sounds of everyday life. Women haggled over prices, children played nearby, and the aroma of freshly baked bread filled the air. Iskezoba and his son, Odian, strode through, exuding authority. Is, the current Okabashi, wore a pendant symbolizing his status, adorned with rare gems and gold, a legacy passed down through generations. In a secluded corner of the market, Odian had earlier whispered to one of his loyal men, Namdi. Make sure the pendant ends up in Amora Mother's shop, Odian instructed with a sinister smile. Namdi nodded, understanding the plan. As they walked, Odian subtly nodded to Namdi. Odian suddenly stopped, pretending to notice something intriguing at a vendor store. Father, have you seen these carvings? He called out, ensuring Ize's attention was diverted. Ize, intrigued by the carvings, leaned in closer to inspect the intricate details. Seizing the opportunity, Namdi moved with swift precision, his fingers deftly reaching for the pendant. Just as he grazed it, he spun around, catching him red-handed. Ize's eyes blazed with anger and confusion. What is the meaning of this, he roared, recognizing Namdi as one of Odian's men. He turned to his son, his voice cold and commanding. Odian, explain yourself. Why would your man try to steal my pendant? Odian, caught off guard, stammered, Father, I, he glanced at Namdi, realizing the gravity of the situation. Trembling, he finally confessed, I wanted to punish a lady who humiliated me publicly. By implicating her mother, I could force her to beg at my knees. Isa's furious expression slowly transformed into a sly smile. That's my son, 
he said approvingly. We Kizobas can do and have anything in this world, but learn to do it with pride. He then removed the pendant and handed it to Namdi. Carry on, he instructed, and continued walking as if nothing had happened. Namdi, now with the pendant in hand, quickly moved towards Nena's shop, accompanied by another guard, Chidi. Upon reaching the shop, Chidi engaged Nena in conversation, admiring the vibrant fabrics and handcrafted jewelry, effectively diverting her attention. Meanwhile, Namdi slipped into the back of the shop, discreetly planting the pendant in a hidden luggage amidst the colorful textiles. With the deed done, he exited quietly, joining Chidi at the front. Namdi gave a subtle nod to Odian from a distance, signaling that the task was complete. Odian, receiving the signal from his men, continued working with his father. As they approached the busier section of the market, Odian signaled to ease. Right at the center of the market. Suddenly, Is clutched his chest in alarm. My pendant. It's gone, he exclaimed. Odian's eyes narrowed. Father, let me handle this, he said, turning to his men. Search the market. Leave no stone unturned. The market fell silent as the Kizoba guards began their search, rummaging through stalls and interrogating vendors. Fear spread among the market women, who knew that crossing the Kizobas could bring dire consequences. The guards reached the shop of Nena, Amora's mother. Her shop, filled with colorful fabrics and handcrafted jewelry, was well respected. Search her shop, Odian commanded coldly. The guards ransacked Nena's belongings, scattering items across the ground. Finally, one of them pulled out the missing pendant from hidden luggage. Nena's eyes widened in shock. I did not take it. I swear on my ancestors, she pleaded. The market women gathered around, horrified. Nena would never do such a thing, one woman said. We have known her for years. She is honest and kind. Odian's face darkened. Anyone who defends her will be arrested alongside her, he threatened. Silence fell over the crowd. Amora arrived, her heart sinking at the sight of her mother in distress. She rushed to her side, tears streaming down her face. Mother! Amora cried out. She turned to Odian, trembling. This is a mistake. My mother would never steal. Odian leaned in close, his voice a sinister whisper. Agree to marry me, Amora, and your mother will be spared. Refuse, and she will spend the rest of her life in prison. Amora was speechless. She tried to reason with him, but Odian pushed her away with a cruel smile. The choice is yours, he said, leaving with his men. After Odian left, Amara collapsed, sobbing uncontrollably. Ikin arrived, drawn by the commotion. He knelt beside Amara, his heart breaking. Amara, what happened? he asked gently. Through her tears, Amara explained the situation. Ikin's eyes hardened with determination. I will help you save your mother, Amora. I promise. That night, as Amora lay in bed, she realized the gravity of their predicament. At dawn, she made her way to Odian's compound to announce her agreement to marry him. Odian greeted her with a triumphant smile. I knew you would come to your senses, he said smugly. You can see your mother in prison but she will only be released after the Umutivo hunt and on the day of our wedding. You have hurt my pride, and this is your penance. Amora was allowed a brief visit with her mother. Stay strong, my daughter, Nena whispered. We will find a way through this. Odian ordered his men to escort Amora home. Even the king has no say in this matter, he boasted. 
As they approached her home, Ikin was waiting. She dismissed the guards and approached Ikin, who looked at her with concern. What have you done, Amara? he asked, anguished. I had no choice, Amara replied. My mother's life is at stake. Ikin took a deep breath. Amora, I love you. I cannot stand by and watch this happen. I will solve this situation, I promise. But Amora shook her head, tears streaming down her face. It's too late, Ikin. We must never see each other again. She turned and went inside, leaving Ikin heartbroken and alone. Determined to save Amora and her mother, Ikin resolved to confront the Kizobas and bring justice to Nkiru, no matter the cost. As the sun dipped low on the horizon, casting long shadows across the village square, the final preparations for the Umutivo hunt were underway. The village buzzed with excitement and anticipation, drums beating rhythmically as women sang traditional songs of valor and courage. Young men, proud and eager, stood tall, each one hoping to prove himself in the esteemed hunt. The night before, Ikin lay awake in his modest home, his mind racing. He had lost his father and now faced losing Amora to Odian's schemes. The only way to protect her and bring justice to the village was to become the new Okabashi. With this realization, a fire of determination ignited within him. Despite the enrollment being closed, Ikin stepped forward the next morning, causing a hush among the villagers. Known for his quiet, reserved nature, his decision to join the hunt was unexpected. Ikin approached the elders overseeing the registration, bowing respectfully. I wish to participate in the Yumutivo hunt, he said, his voice clear and steady. Elder Nkosi, surprised, asked, Ikin, the enrollment has been closed for weeks. Why do you seek to join now? I have my reasons, Elder Nkosi. I believe I can contribute to the hunt and honor the spirit of the Yumutivo tradition, Ikin replied with unwavering resolve. After a tense pause, Erdan Kosi nodded. Very well, Ikin. You will be allowed to join the hunt. May you prove your worth and honor our ancestors. As Ikin walked away, the villagers watched with renewed interest. Unknown to most, Ikin possessed remarkable skills and knowledge passed down from his father, Udo, a legendary hunter whose teachings lived on in his son. With determination in his heart and his father's wisdom guiding his steps, Ikin prepared for the hunt with meticulous care. Each weapon and tool he gathered was a testament to his late father's expertise. This hunt was not just about proving himself but also about protecting his loved ones and bringing justice to Nkiru. It was a day to the Yumutivo hunt. The village of Nkiru was abuzz with excitement. Young men prepared for the competition, each eager to prove their worth. Among them was Ikin, whose quiet demeanor masked the fire of determination burning within him. Meanwhile, the Kizoba family plotted to maintain their dominance. Odien, having heard rumors about Ikin's potential to end the Kizoba family's reign, grew increasingly anxious. Learning that Ikin was the son of Udo, a legendary hunter whose tales he had only heard in whispers filled Odian with dread. He had never seen Ikin's skills firsthand and feared the unknown. Seeking guidance, Odian turned to his father, Is Kizoba. Is, a man of shrewd intelligence, shared his son's concerns. Realizing the threat Ikin posed, Is devised a plan. He personally approached Ikin, extending an invitation to join Odian's hunting group, promising him vast privileges and wealth. Ikin, however, saw through the deceit and rejected the offer, determined to compete on his own terms. Refusing to be thwarted, is resorted to bribery. He approached the hunt organizers, slipping them a generous sum of money along with a specially crafted map. The map, 
unlike the official Yumotivo hunting maps, led to the most remote and perilous part of the forest. Unaware of the treachery and swayed by greed, the organizers agreed to give Ikin the force map, believing it marked spots with the best game. The morning of the hunt dawned bright and clear. The village square was a sea of color as villagers gathered to witness the grand event. Drummers played rhythmic beats, dancers moved with grace, and elders chanted blessings. The king, Iskezoba, the participants, and all the villagers assembled for the opening ceremony. King Obesai stood at the center, his voice carrying authority and wisdom. He offered prayers for the safety and success of the hunters, invoking the spirits of the ancestors to guide and protect them. The hunters, including the solo hunter Ikin, audience hunt group, and other groups who gathered themselves, stood ready, their hearts pounding with anticipation. As the ceremony concluded, the hunters received their maps and final instructions. Ikin was discreetly handed the false map by one of the organizers, a man who had facilitated his late entry into the competition, Eldan Kosi. He spoke in harsh tones, assuring Ikin that the map highlighted areas teeming with game, but with more prestigious animals. Trusting the man's words, Ikin accepted the map, unaware of the betrayal. With the king's signal, the hunters dispersed into the forest, each following their designated path. Ikin moved swiftly, relying on his instincts and the knowledge imparted by his father. The forest was dense and filled with the sounds of nature, both enchanting and ominous. As Ikin ventured deeper, the terrain grew more treacherous. The map led him far from the usual hunting grounds, into an area where the trees grew thicker and the shadows longer. Undeterred, Ikin pressed on, his senses alert. Hours passed, and the forest seemed to close in around him. Suddenly, he stumbled upon a hidden clearing, a sight that filled him with horror. Before him was a slave camp, operated by armed overseers. Men, women, and children toiled under the watchful eyes of the guards, their faces etched with despair. Realizing the gravity of his discovery, Iki knew he had to act. But before he could formulate a plan, he was ambushed by the guards. Overwhelmed by their numbers, he fought valiantly but was eventually captured. The guards bound him and dragged him to a deep well, used as a makeshift prison for new slaves and those who dared to escape. Thrown into the well, Ikin landed hard, the air knocked from his lungs. The darkness was oppressive, but his resolve remained unbroken. Drawing on his father's teachings, he struck stones together until a small spark ignited a flame. The light revealed the grim interior of the well and a narrow passage partially hidden by debris. Determined to escape, Ikin cleared the passage and squeezed through the tight space. The passage led to a series of tunnels, likely old escape routes from the well. Moving cautiously, Ikin used the flickering flame to guide him through the labyrinthine tunnels. After what felt like an eternity, he emerged into a dimly lit chamber. His heart raced as he heard the faint sound of voices. He followed the sound until he reached a small cell. Inside, a rough-looking man sat hunched, his face obscured by shadows. As Ikin approached, he heard the man singing a song. The old man's voice was weak but filled with emotion. A flash of recognition passed as he remembered it was the same song his father loved singing. He lifted up the man's eyes as he completed the song. Ikin, the man whispered, his eyes welling with tears. It was Udo, Ikin's father, who had been lost to the village for thirty years. The realization hit Ikin like a thunderbolt. The man in the pit prison was his father. Udo had survived all these years. Summoning strength and hope, Udo embraced his son. After a moment of reunion, Ikin learned the shocking truth, the slave village was owned by the Kizoba family. 
they had orchestrated Udo's capture during the Umutivo hunt 30 years ago, leading him into this trap. Ikin's heart swelled with a mixture of sorrow and determination as he embraced his father, vowing to bring justice to their family and their village. However, how would both of them get out of the well prison and dismantle the Kizoba's dark operations? What new challenges and dangers would they face in their quest for freedom and justice? How will Ikin, armed with the skills and knowledge passed down from his father, confront the powerful Kizoba family and expose their secrets to the village? And above all, will Ikin be able to save the love of his life, Amora, from Odian's clutches and the looming danger. The scene ended with a poignant moment of reunion, setting the stage for the next chapter of their fight against the Kizoba's tyranny. Stay tuned for part two of this epic tale, where courage, resilience, and the unbreakable bond between father and son will be tested to their limits. Join Ikin as he navigates through treacherous paths, unravels deep conspiracies, and battles formidable foes to restore peace and justice in Kiru village. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you won't miss out on part 2.